<laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's Chris Gates, uh, the president of Sunlight, and I want to welcome everybody to today's webinar. We're excited to have everybody on the call. I think that uh, for those of you who have read a bit about this, we've spent a great deal of time trying to explore the relationship between those who spend money either through political campaigns or through lobbying to influence policy and then what that translates to on the other end. And so the, the Fix Fortunes project has, has been um, an immense amount of work over a long period of time and we're excited that Bill Allison will walk through uh, the presentation today. For those of you who don't know Bill, he's the editorial director here at Sunlight. He's been with us since our inception in 2006 and before he was at Sunlight, he was at the Center for Public Integrity, and before that, the Philadelphia Inquirer. He's done a great job in pulling an immense amount of information uh, and complex information together in a way that tells a story that's really important. So with that, I'll turn it over to Bill. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, so um, Fix Fortunes really began with a, a premise, and let me just get the slides moving. Um, and the premise is actually in the Citizens United case, uh, Citizens United versus FEC. Um, and this idea was that, uh, uh, and as I love the way they phrase this, that democracy is premised on responsiveness. And basically that they include in the opinion, you know, this, and for this line about how um, basically the, the only legitimate reason to give a campaign contribution or to vote for somebody is that you want certain policy outcomes. Um, this is actually, you find this in Justice Department language too. This is from the U.S. Attorney's Man, uh, Manual for Going After Public Corruption. And it describes that you, know, you can go after a bribery charge on a campaign finance, but it's under very limited circumstances. And I highlight a little put a part of this text because the Justice Department says to their U.S. attorneys that campaign contributions are almost always given and received with a generalized expectation um, of currying favor with the candidate benefiting therefrom. And, you know, that to me, you know, I think really says a lot about how our system works. And so, uh, and if you think about it, we just got through an election where, um, you know, we have, you know, all of these people raising tons and tons of money. And I don't mean to pick on any one particular politician, but I just happened to see this in uh, Politico and the Hill writing about this. And, you know, had Republicans lost the majority in the House, you'd be seeing the same kind of stories about how John Boehner is so great at raising money. But um, uh, in the interviews, uh, and this was a, an indirect quote from, from Politico, but she said that the donors give money because they believe in the Democrats' mission, which is a little bit different from the way the Justice Department looks at it. And again, just to uh, give you a little perspective, uh, Nancy Pelosi raised $100 million for the DCCC. That meant she spent 200 days on the road raising money, and you know her, uh, she's very proud of her ability to do that. And I don't think instantly the people in the picture are the kind of people that she's raising $100 million from. But one of the big problems with our, uh, our campaign finance system, we have a lack of disclosure when people do raise money from these other, you know, it's, it's very hard to trace back which candidate is raising or which member of Congress is raising the leadership money. But that's a separate issue. Uh, which we're not really going to address here. So let me get back to Citizens United for a second. Folks will let me move it. Um, so there were two other quotes in Citizens United that we found interesting. And this was, the ban on corporate speech uh, is not, uh, you know, just because you can have a political action committee doesn't mean a corporation can speak. That it's a separate entity, it's hard to set up, it takes time. Uh, and further, you know, it, it quotes, uh, there's a, in the second, it says that basically you can't have effective communication because it takes too long to set up a PAC or it's too burdensome. And this actually comes from a, Scalia, a line from Scalia's dissent in McConnell where it quotes, and it talks about, you know, what would happen if Congress were to instantly decide it was going to ban nuclear weapons or, or uh, overturn, you know, I'm sorry, ban nuclear power, overturn the Second Amendment. Uh, pass some kind of horrible environmental law. Uh, now, we know from having been in Washington, I've been here for a long time, I mean, almost nothing gets done quickly in Washington, and nothing gets done so quickly that special interests can't react to it, either through lobbying campaigns or, I mean, there's a whole host of ways they can do it, and they're certainly able to respond to uh, events like elections, which are regular, that happen every two years, that, uh, you know, you have a lot of time. So. The idea that PACs uh, weren't uh, successful vehicles for money in politics or for influencing Washington or for getting corporate viewpoints across to Congress just seemed to us to be a little bit off. And 
And it kind of raised the question, you know, was Citizens United really a necessary thing? I mean, you know, back in the day, um, political action committees, the traditional ones that raise money in $5,000 chunks, were the source of most independent expenditures. And if you go back to ads, everything from, you know, Michael Dukakis riding, riding around in the tank, those were paid for by traditional political action com committees raising money uh, 5000 bucks a, at a time or less. Um, so to, to answer this uh, we picked a set of donors uh, and, you know, try to quantify to see, you know, do corporations, is there some kind of muted quality that they can't influence government or can they? And we really wanted to try to quantify this and not just say, well, here's, you know, all this money they spent on lobbying without being able to say, um, you know, was there an impact or not uh, or regulations. You know, what we wanted to do was just kind of look at the money going in and was there money going out on the other side, which was sort of, in my m mind, kind of the simplest way to do this to show whether or not dom democracy was uh, responsive or not. So we ended up with the Fixed Fortunes Project. Um, I should begin by saying that, you know, the first step was identifying, you know, who these companies were going to be. And, you know, somewhat arbitrary process for this first release, which I'll explain in a minute, but just a shout out to the folks at OpenSecrets.org who helped out a lot, and also to my uh, partner, the NICAR fellow, uh, Sarah Harkins, who did the bulk of the campaign finance analysis, and I would have been lost without her. And I think the division of labor is if there's something right, that was Sarah's uh, work. Uh, she was just amazing. Uh, but anyway, so we took, we started with uh, the data from Open Secrets, uh, the coded campaign finance data from 2007 to 2012, and we tried to identify the 200 biggest uh, donors among for-profit corporations, and we set certain parameters. One was that they have an active political action committee, and this seemed to us important, first of all, because there's always a certain amount of uh, signal-to-noise ratio when you have individual contributions, there will be the odd person who's an environmentalist working for the worst, uh, you know, most polluting oil company in the world that gives to environmental candidates, uh, or maybe giving to a candidate for a totally different reason. But PACs are run by the boardrooms of corporations and by the, usually by the, um, you know, somebody in government affairs. Uh, and we felt like this, that we wanted to make sure that we had PACs because that was an expression of direct corporate giving, that, you know, this is, it reflects the intentions of the corporations. Second, we wanted them to have a Washington lobbying presence because, um, you know, Washington is, uh, or the lobbyists are uh, people who influence and interact with government regularly. Uh, so we wanted to make sure they had that. And then the last one we included was 50% uh, of the contributions were 50% or more were hard money. And by this, um, uh, well, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, uh, and I just went over lobbying and all of that. So by doing this, we excluded some big names. And on the right, you see Las Vegas Sands Corp, because if you include all of Sheldon Adelson's super PAC contributions, you know, I think he was the number one company. But this was really an individual donor who gave for many different reasons. And I don't mean to say that we are not going to include um, uh, or not going to look at super PAC donors at some point. We have, uh, we're going to actually try to do it in uh, the beginning of January. Um, with a piece because we did pull out all that data. And, but we, ju we just felt like there was a difference between somebody who gives as a super PAC donor as opposed to the kind of uh, work a day, every day, they're here year after year after year, and they contribute to members of Congress. And the other one is Apple Computer, which is obviously a big company. They, uh, they were on our list except that they haven't had a political action committee. And again, we just decided that we wanted to stick with something that, you know, with companies that had PACs and had made that commitment to having a Washington presence. Uh, and then we also removed a bunch of other donors. I mentioned that we're just doing profit corporations, so there were no lobbying firms, no law firms, no unions uh, that made the cut. Uh, and then we, and I guess the last step was we went through and we verified that, you know, these companies actually lobbied. And this is one of very, very many spreadsheets that we made uh, you can see like the number, on this one I, I included the number of revolvers and total number of, of lobbyists um, year by year. And you can see that, you know, some of these, these groups like AT&T has 170 some lobbyists and, uh, you know, these are not small groups of people that are working uh, Capitol Hill for these organizations. Um, so then, so once we had identified the companies, the next step was to figure out something about them. So, and one of the things that we were interested in was, 
uh, you know, because a lot of these organizations have subsidiaries, and a lot of those subsidiaries turn up in federal data sets, and if you don't know the name of the subsidiary, you can't link it to the parent. Um, so this was like a real slow and tedious process. We used, uh, obviously we took advantage of the Center for Responsive Politics, which already does a lot of this work, identifying parent and child relationships, but that's only for, for companies where a employee has contributed to a campaign that they will find that. There were several where that just wasn't the case, and you're looking at Fen Mechanica, you know, here are five subsidiaries. The one at the very bottom, uh, which is um, uh, Fermont, it's a, they make uh, generators, portable generators for the military, and they haven't been called that, and I don't know how long, I couldn't even find a company logo online. The closest I could get for an image for that is this, uh, you know, generator plaque. Um, but they still show up in uh, federal, and I'm, I'm sorry, this was a huge, um, I think I skip, I'm going to skip a slide. They, they, that company name still shows up in, you know, government documents. And, you know, here's one where uh, you've got Fermont of Bridgeport, Connecticut. This is a, a budget document, and that's an upcoming release. We're going to really analyze these in depth. Um, but, uh, you know, but so there's this company turning up, and if you don't know, you know, that they were, that they're actually now DRS Power, which is part of Fin Mechanica, it's something of a mess. And, and here, incidentally, are all the different names of organizations that are part of DRS. Uh, and actually, that's not all of them. That's just like one tiny slice of a very, very long uh, database uh, with all these different organizations in them. So once we'd had our companies and we were confident that we had like a pretty good uh, idea of, of um, who the subsidiaries are, we decided to take a look at, um, you know, start looking for data and what were they getting. And, you know, one of the first sources we went to was usaspending.gov. Uh, I know the data is not great in this site, but, um, you know, uh, Sunlight was instrumental in getting this stuff released online. Uh, we looked at FPDS and some other sources of data, FedBizOps, which has, you know, award information, and we just felt like this was, for our purposes, the best to work with. Uh, FPDS had some strange things like, um, d um, I, I, I'm trying to remember, Tennessee Valley Authority contracts show up, and Tennessee Valley Authority doesn't actually report its own contracts. It was other government agencies reporting those contracts, which was just a little bit off. And when we talked to TVA about them, they weren't quite sure what they were. And they said that, you know, they weren't going to verify those numbers. So there were just like some weird things like that. And we just thought for consistency's sake, we'd stick with USA spending. Um, and then we also went to, um, uh, we got data from the Treasury. And this was one of my favorite things. This is a uh, one of the TARP spreadsheets and an explanation of it, and that was a lot of fun going through all of that kind of stuff. Uh, and we also did some FOIA requests. Um, there was one major data set we were trying to get from the Treasury Department, which we weren't able to get, although I hope at some point we'll get it. But uh, that would have made this a lot easier, although maybe a lot harder because it was a huge data set, but, um, uh, and, and standardizing it would have been a, a real pain in the neck. But anyway, so that's what we did. What we we did, and so and so here's kind of what we looked at, uh, and where we got you know different sources of data or different uh, information from, and like with USA Spending, we downloaded both individual company records, just doing this front end you know search, and we would also download like the whole agency, and we try to cross reference them, make sure that there wasn't um, uh, you know differences and. Uh, and errors. Uh, we used some of recovery.gov. I mean, one of my favorite stories, and actually it doesn't end up in the data because we could never, uh, we found out that Allison Transmission was not a wholly owned subsidiary of Carlisle. It was only a third. But Carlisle uh, Group, which is uh, uh, one of the organizations, they practice what they like to call access capitalism. Uh, it was a bunch of former government officials who founded the group, and they work in highly regulated areas of the economy. Um, one of their uh, acquisitions was this company, Allison Transmission, and uh, one of the very first things they did after acquiring it from General Motors was to get a $62.5 million grant from the Energy Department uh, to help that uh, company retool and start making uh, hybrid transmissions for trucks and buses. Um, uh, from data.gov, we got Exim Bank data. Um, uh, it was just better to get it from there. That was one of the very few exceptions where we didn't use USA spending data. And the reason was on data.gov, you can not only see who the company uh, getting the loan is, you can see the company that's the exporter, which is actually being paid the money, and then you can see the, the organization that's getting the loan guarantee. And this would usually be like JPMorgan Chase and 
uh, Citibank, and a bunch of other uh, big banks. And then on the Treasury side, we pulled in the TAR programs, uh, information from the takeover of AIG, uh, and then the Federal Reserve, a lot of their interventions in the market. Um, in, the, in the project, we use the term $4.4 trillion in business and, uh, and federal business and federal support. And the distinction between the two is, uh, you know, in it's uh, business is money that's kept by the companies. And by that, I mean, you know, when you get a contract, you're paid to do work, you don't pay that money back. When you get uh, an AIG counterparty payment, you know, that we've included that. Uh, this is when uh, basically AIG had a bunch of contracts with a bunch of different um, um, uh, financial institutions, and if they ran into financial trouble, AIG would bail them out. They ran into financial uh, trouble. AIG didn't have the money to bail it out. Taxpayers gave them that money to help them, this basically insurance against making bad uh, investments. And uh, that was money that these organizations didn't have to give back, so we included that. And then lastly, we have the Exim Bank's payments to exporters. And, you know, and there's a little bit, you know, you can count Exim Bank money three ways, and I should add we were very careful not to double count any uh, money. But um, uh, in, when you hear defenders of the Export-Import Bank talk about what it does, and it talks about how these deals would not happen, uh, Russia would not, Russian airlines would not buy airplanes from Boeing, and Malaysian airplanes would not buy airplanes from Boeing if uh, the Export-Import Bank didn't step in to loan the money to those airlines to buy the planes from Boeing. So we felt it was fair to include that, that these are deals that would not have happened without the Export-Import Bank for Boeing. Uh, and then we have the second category is kind of what I like to think of as conditional money. And, you know, this is money that has to be paid back or should be paid back. Um, there's a, I have a whole list of it. You know, actually, if you go to the download page, you can get, you know, all these different raw data sets. But some of the big ones, the capital purchase program, uh, auto industry finding, financing, and the target investment program from TARP. And one of the things that was really interesting, we found that, um, you know, these companies that are companies in our um, – uh, fixed fortunes 200 got 298 billion out of the 410 billion that was ultimately spent uh, on TARP. Uh, you know the original Emergency Economic Stabilization Act. I think it was like about 760 million it called for. The program ended up being a lot less. And again, this is all money that's paid back, but it's also money that you know a lot of these companies needed to survive. Um, and there's, you know, there, you can debate whether or not, you know, there's been some talk that, you know, well, Bank of America didn't really need the money or Citigroup or J.P. Morgan Chase. Well, there were big financial organizations that just turned down the money, New York Life Insurance being one. And they were actually one of the companies when we went across in every single category. I mean, I think they came up with goose eggs all the way across. So it's not as if these had to take this money if they didn't want to. Uh, we also included, you know, a bunch of Federal Reserve uh, programs, and I'll have a little bit on that in a second. Uh, but then the one thing which I really want to tell you is that these are squishy numbers as, you know, any big federal data set and any kind of thing where you're comparing all kinds of different uh, data sources. And let me just give you an example. The contract numbers that we use, these are dollars obligated by the federal government. So Lockheed Martin or Northrop Grumman or any company wins a contract for $100 million dollars they may hire Raytheon or um, Joe's Coffee Shop to do some subcontracting for them. So they will, Lockheed will keep less than that $100 million. Uh, but it also doesn't include any subcontracts that Lockheed Martin would get or any other federal contractor. So, you know, it's tough to say what the true amount of revenue from federal contracts any of these companies have. Although where we could, uh, we ran, uh, you know, we checked uh, annual reports. And, you know, here's an example. This is from Lockheed Martins, and we did six years of these that roughly correspond. I mean, their fiscal year is a little bit different than the fiscal than the years that we were looking at uh, for the campaign finance. But, you know, Lockheed Martin explains that they had 82 percent of revenue um, uh, was from the federal government, and these are both contracts and subcontracts. Um, so you can calculate, and they also give you your t their total revenue. And so when we broke it down, you know, we found from USA Spending $213.8 billion in contracts for Lockheed Martin. Uh, over roughly that analysis, analogous period, Lockheed Martin had $272.8 billion that they reported in annual reports to the Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, $226.8 billion of that was from those federal government's contracts and subcontracts. 
And what's kind of interesting is just $4 billion or 1.5% of their revenues was selling to private and other customers with the balance, either foreign U.S. military arms sales or um, uh, some state and local. And it just it seems really kind of fascinating to me because, you know, um, and this is just a pet peeve of mine that I'm just bringing up. This guy is Jonathan Gruber. He's, of course, the MIT economist who's been in some hot water for some comments he's made about the Affordable Care Act. But if you look to the right of his, his smiling picture, um, you know, that's a record in USAspending.gov of a federal contract that he had. And if you'll note, he didn't make any campaign contributions, not that he was a big donor to begin with, but there's no campaign contributions between 2004 and 2012 from him. Uh, had he made campaign contributions as the holder of a contract, he would have been breaking the law. And what's interesting is we have all of these huge contractors, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, uh, that are not uh, breaking the law, and I, you know, because of the way that the law is written and the way that this is set up, but they're able to influence, you know, obviously a huge amount of influence on government, and you know, just as one area of reform, reform that people might be thinking of, you know, revisiting what those rules are and how uh, we, um, you know, regulate, you know, who's allowed to give to candidates. That may be one thing to take a look at. This is just something that occurred to me while doing this, but. I'm certainly not a policy guy, so but it just kept jumping out at me that look at all these contractors giving all this money. Wait a second, I can't. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Um, we also included uh, some extra information from other organizations and Citizens for Tax Justice were kind enough to let us link to some of the studies that they did. You know, one of the things that you know, obviously we're quantifying as much as we can, but there's a huge amount of federal influence that has nothing to do with, with contracts or money or, or you know, um, uh, support from the Federal Reserve. Um, so we have uh, from Citizens for Tax Justice their uh, percentages of uh, their effective corporate tax rates for some of these companies that overlap with ours, not all of them. I think there's about uh, 80 or so. Uh, but you can, and we have links to each of those uh, CTJ profiles of these companies. And the folks at Good Jobs First, uh, they track state and local subsidies that these companies won or win. And a lot of times there's a little bit of overlap between some you know, federal activity and state and local subsidies, but these are just state and local subsidies. And they're worth taking a look at for those companies as well. And, and for them, uh, the years, some of those go all the way back to the 1970s that they've tracked them. So it's a really, really in-depth and complete data set. And let me just add, too, that on the, and there's a, uh, for folks who want to copy this PowerPoint, there's a link on it. But on our Fixed Fortunes page, uh, you can get, uh, download all the data that we um, uh, put together for this, uh, download it, and, and a CSV. Um, okay, and jumping ahead, you know, obviously, you know, there's, uh, you know, that this has been a consideration for us, you know, throughout the time we've been doing this, and I said, you know, squishy numbers. Um, you know, the obvious problem is, you know, are we comparing apples and oranges and xylophones by coming up with a number by 4.4 trillion? And in some ways, you know, I really didn't think so. And the reason why I think that, you know, it's, it's fair to talk about these things is that, you know, all of these payments have been authorized by some kind of federal authority, whether it's a statutory authority, whether it's an emergency spending that's done by Congress. Um, um, whether it's you know something like the uh, the Stimulus Act, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, and uh, and you know just take the Federal Reserve, and this is a clip from uh, one of the data sets we use, the term asset. Um, um, oh boy, by forgetting what TALF, TALF is now, <laughs> uh, term asset lending facility, and um, and you know and it says that it's created under Section 13.3 of the Federal Reserve Act. And this is something that Congress set up so that the Federal Reserve Board in, you know, in unusual and exigent circumstances, which of course, you know, the 2008-2009 financial crisis was, the Fed is authorized to extend credit to individuals, partnerships, and corporations, and they did. And it's not just, um, you know, financial institutions. I mean, one of the Fed facilities, it was the commercial paper funding facility, I believe, um, you have companies like, you know, uh, McDonald's and, um, uh, you know, a bunch of different sort of consumer companies that people know. I think um, there are some department stores in there that aren't able to sell their short-term commercial paper, which they use to meet payroll or for short-term purchases to pay suppliers and things like that. And the Federal Reserve basically loaned money to an institution that would buy the commercial paper from 
uh, these entities. So, you know, they really extended pretty deeply into the economy, and, you know, and capturing that, I think, was, you know, a worthwhile undertaking. Um, so, I guess, like, um, uh, the question then is, you know, so we've done all this work, we've pulled all this together, and what does it all mean? And for me, it kind of goes back to that relationship between these donors and members of Congress and, you know, the amount of time they spend, you know, what do they spend doing, um, and they do a lot of different things, but, you know, every member of Congress will say that they have to spend too much time fundraising. And, you know, what kind of impact does that have? And, you know, just the other day I saw Tim Ryan, uh, representative from Ohio, uh, he was on C-SPAN a couple days after the election. He wasn't too happy about it. Uh, he was talking about, you know, the election, what went wrong, and also the Democrats' economic program and their uh, agenda for Congress. And so he pointed to a facility in Youngstown, Ohio, that, you know, the Democrats know how to restart the economy. And he's talking about this, um, this institute that President Obama started. It's one of his manufacturing institutes. And these are actually... Uh, and I don't mean to be, you know, saying that these are horrible ideas or anything. These are actually trying to, you know, restart American manufacturing. But if you look at who the groups are that he's talking about, he mentions Boeing, Lockheed Martin, and Simmons. Simmons, incidentally, would have been about number 210 on our list. That's what you get for arbitrarily cutting things off at 200. But so he's talking about these three companies that came to his district, and this is part of this private uh, uh, public partnership. And, uh, you know, if you look at this program, the companies put up a couple million to participate. The federal government puts up about 50 million, and they're doing research on different manufacturing techniques. But I went to Influence Explorer, you know, just to take a look at, which is a sunlight thing, and I plugged in uh, a bunch of different fields. And, uh, you know, I happened to know the Penguin Pack was Tim Ryan's pack because when he started it, I was the one who uh, was able to trace it back to him when Open Secrets had Find the Mystery Packs. Um, but anyway, so we pulled this together, and you've got, uh, you know, uh, Tim Ryan, his PAC, and the three donors, and the three cycles we looked at. And there were 46 separate contributions from Boeing, Lockheed Martin, and Simmons to him over that time, $57,000 in all. It's not a huge amount of money. Um, but you look at the other participants in this, um, in this uh, manufacturing initiative. You've got General Electric, General Dynamic, Honeywell, Timken, among others. And, you know, I, you know, I, I kind of question whether, uh, you know, when you're thinking about how to jumpstart the economy, um, you know, we already give an awful lot of money to these companies. And I think that, you know, it's an open question whether that's the, you know, the proper thing to do. But I wonder if, you know, with members of Congress spending so much time with these kinds of folks, if, you know, everything starts to look like, you know, what's the old saying, you know, when, when you have a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. Well, when you're talking to or spending an inordinate amount of your time, talking to some of these big donors, everything starts to look like, uh, or they start to look like the solution to a lot of your problems. And at that moment, I'm going to pause or stop and open up the floor to questions if there are any. And I think it's um, star six, star seven to unmute. Star six to unmute. Star six to unmute, sorry. Um, it might be helpful to um, show a little bit of your findings. From the story, oh, sure. if you want to. Yeah, so, um, and let me see. Uh, can you share yes. the screen? Okay. Um, so, you know, when we were, um, boy, I could totally forget that we actually did a story. Um, so, okay. you know, when we're doing this, you know, I mean, one of the most amazing things to me is, you know, so we looked at, you know, the number of contracts that were uh, given. And, again, government contracting numbers are incredibly, incredibly squishy. Um, uh, but... The government says, you know, its best estimate is about $3 trillion in contracts it gave out between 2007 and 2012. And if you look at what, um, you know, some of these companies got, it was the, the companies on here that got contracts, that was $1 trillion. So about a third of the contracts, and again, those are dollars obligated, but, you know, are won by these different uh, companies. Um, another finding that just kind of blew me away that I had to check the math five or six times just to make sure that I wasn't doing something really stupid, uh, just these 200 companies accounted for among disclosed lobbying spending. Um, they accounted for 26% uh, of it, which that $5.8 billion. Now, there are about 20,000 some entities that lobby uh, the federal government with, you know, that reported some kind of spending. You know, this doesn't include the ones that reported no um, uh, no expenditures, and uh, and this is like you know so these companies 26%, which just seemed to me to be a huge amount of money, um, 
uh, or a, a huge percentage of the lobbying influence on Capitol Hill from uh, these companies. Um, another thing that um, uh, I think was really interesting was the spread of members of Congress that they go after. I mean, if you take the average, it's about, um, uh, on average, a company is going to about 144 members of Congress. Um, if you look at, um, you know, individually, I mean, some of these organizations are giving to, I mean, among incumbent members of Congress to three or four hundred different members, um, which is just, you know, again, a huge amount of money. There was, uh, I can remember when I was at the Center for Public Integrity, we did a, something with Frontline uh, where we interviewed, um, it was Robert Strauss who was speaking for Archer Daniel Midman's uh, chairman, uh, Dwayne Andreas, who wouldn't go on camera, but Robert Strauss would. And so one of the questions for him was, you know, why does he give so much money to both the Democratic and Republican presidential campaigns? And he says, well, he supports the office of the presidency. Well, you know, a lot of these institutions support the, the office of Congress, I guess, or the offices of Congress, you know, because they do give to both parties. Not every company, there are splits. The energy companies tend to give more to uh, Republicans. Some of the telecommunications c companies, particularly the ones like, you know, Time Warner and Disney, give more to, to Democrats. I think the same is true for some of the software companies. But, um, but really, I mean, the, the thing that's remarkable is how much they spread their money around on Capitol Hill. And actually, there's one other point which I wanted to make, which I think I went, it was going really fast. So I'm going to go back to how we rank these and why they're ranked the way they are. Um, one of the things about lobbying uh, uh, donations, you know, we, we would have loved to rank them by political spending, you know, the total, but lobbying dollars are reported, you know, there's two different methods that they use. There's uh, for, for, for companies, there's method A, which is the uh, definitions used by the Lobbying Disclosure Act, and then there's method C, which is uh, um, things reported by uh, the um, Internal Revenue Service. And the Internal Revenue Service does not allow companies to, um, um, uh, the Internal Revenue Service is not, uh, or tax code does not allow companies, for-profit corporations. I see there's a question, which is why I was pausing, and I'll answer that in a second. Um, Internal, Revenue or Internal Revenue Code does not allow companies to deduct what they spend on politics, and so because they keep those numbers, uh, they're allowed to report them, but the definition is different. It includes state spending and a whole bunch of other money that isn't covered by the federal definition, and some companies uh, report using method A, some report using method C, and there was no way that we could really consistently um, you know, come up with a good political spending number. And let me just get to the, uh, a couple of questions that we're seeing online. And um, the, the, there was a question about individual versus corporate donor rules, and I think that this refers to when I was talking about the contracting. Um, it's basically, if you have a federal contract, you can't contribute to uh, a congressional campaign, you can't make an independent expenditure, uh, there was just a ruling as to whether um, a hospital association whose members take money from Trimark the, or TRICARE, the, um, the, which has you know, federal dollars going in to support veterans care and, and military, um, uh, military people who have um, insurance policies, um, you know, could they make campaign contributions to the FEC rule that they could because that's not a contract, they're just reimbursing on a life insurance policy. But basically the way this works is that because Lockheed Martin Employees Good Government Association is not Lockheed Martin, it's a separate corporate entity, it's a 527, it's separate from the corporation, that entity can give money because it does not have any federal contracts. Whereas if you're Jonathan Gruber or if Bill Allison had a federal contract, I could not donate to, or Jonathan Gruber could not donate to a federal politician without breaking the law. And um, uh, and that's, you know, one of the, the very strange things. And if we, again, you think about, um, you know, the amount of influence that federal contractors have over the process, and we'll be documenting it in much more gory detail in the next, uh, or in, a, in a later installment of this, but when, you, when we look at the spending documents. But, um, uh, you know, they have a huge amount of influence, and, you know, and part of that is through the ability to campaign contributions, and, 
you know, again, the definition of the court saw. I mean, there was just a case in this. You know, one of the things that we found is there was very little super PAC money in this. Um, uh, there were, um, when we were looking at companies, um, and I think actually if we go back a couple of slides, um, you can see this when we were uh, identifying companies. And let me just see where that is. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, this one. Um, and there is a percentage soft in, in column F, and that was the amount of contributions. And of course, there's a few in there that we ended up eliminating. They're over that 50% tier. There's Contran Corp, which was Harold Simmons' company, and uh, Renaissance Technologies, which is a hedge fund, which also didn't have a PAC. Um, but uh, if you're looking, you know, most of these, you know, it's 0% that taking advantage of Citizens United. I mean, I think the one of the highest was Goldman Sachs, where you know you had six percent, and that was a lot of people giving to, um, I think, to Mitt Romney. Uh, the super PAC that supported Mitt Romney, Restore Our Future, and a few uh, gave to uh, the Democratic side. But anyway, um, uh, you know, corporations haven't taken advantage of this. There's you know, there were the ones that we looked at who were you know perennially among the biggest donors. What they've done instead is, you know, they've continued to give money directly to members, of, to campaigns of members of Congress, to party committees, and so on. Um, and you know, they're still playing this, um, you know, traditional campaign finance game. And if you're looking for, you know, one of the things that we wanted to do in examining the system and examining the impact of Citizens United was to think about: Are there different ways we could be thinking about campaign finance, and how to approach it, and how to approach this problem? And again, I am not a policy guy. But it seems to me that you know the definition of what political action committees are allowed to do, and how you define who a federal contractor is, and when you've got Lockheed Martin employees who you know the vast majority, and again I don't mean to single out Lockheed Martin, there are several other contractors in this uh, position too. Um, but you know if the purpose of that that law, and it's one of the very you know one of the very first campaign finance laws, was stopping people who were at naval shipyards from giving money to members of Congress who were on the appropriations committees. Uh, it was a Civil War era law. Um, you know, this, if this is one of the fundamental things that you're supposed to be doing, well, our campaign finance laws just don't do this at all. And that would be something that, you know, again, I'm not a policy person, but worth taking a look at. Um, and yeah, and I see that there's this, and I think I kind of answered that. There's a question of uh, looking at both Pre and post Citizens United, did you see any difference in how companies spent or how much they spent? And you know, to be honest with you, you know, we didn't see much of a difference. I mean, for most of these companies, they weren't affected. I mean, one that did do something different: uh, Chevron made from directly from their corporate treasury during the period we looked at a two and a half million dollar contribution to. Um, yeah, Chevron's not on there, but they're, they're, uh, they didn't make that cutoff for that spreadsheet. They're a little bit lower. Um, Anyway, but they made a $2.5 million contribution to um, the Congressional Leadership Fund, which some people have linked to John Boehner, and that was a little bit unusual uh, for this group of companies. I mean, we didn't see uh, any other corporate treasury money going to these companies. I mean, these con companies continued to play the same game uh, or do things the same way they've done them for, you know, the last, you know, the first three years of our study. There was a real consistency here in how they operated. And again, you know, the uh, super PACs uh, donors we will be taking a look at in a separate um, release, um, and uh, um, you know, be, because I, and I think, do think there is a difference, and they definitely did have impact. I and mean, we don't mean to saying that they're not. Um, you know, uh, Sheldon Adelson had a uh, you know had conversations with a bunch of Republican lawmakers. There was a bill introduced to uh, severely restrict uh, internet gambling. Uh, to reverse, actually, I think it was an executive uh, order made by uh, Barack Obama about the wire uh, laws, or maybe the Justice Department finding. Uh, but anyway, you know, that's the kind of impact that you get when you contribute, you know, $45 million and your wife gives as much uh, that you get members of Congress introducing uh, bills for you, uh, or you know, willing to introduce bills for you. Um, there's, uh, you know, so but so we'll definitely be looking at them as in the top 25 super PAC donors. Uh, maybe not with the same level of, uh, you know, I mean, obviously these guys are not getting, for the most part, TARP money or federal contracts, so it's a different set of things we're looking for with them. And are there other questions? Oh, 
site. Is there a yeah. yeah, okay. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about you know what's coming. And one of the things that we're going to be looking at next is uh, um, the financial institutions that were on this list. Um, there have been a number of structural changes over the years in the banking industry that have been you know pretty interesting. And these actually go you know well before the period that we're looking at. Um, but you know one of the things I, I find really interesting is is that uh, if you go back and trace through the history of you know legislation. Um, and then compare it to what's being said in election. Um, you know, people, the American people never voted to have, you know, bigger banks, at least not directly. Um, you know, there was a series of acts, you know, starting in 1993 with Regal Neal, and even before that with uh, George H.W. Bush in the 80s, um, lifting one of the Glass-Steagall um, uh, regulations um, and allowing J.P. Morgan Chase and Company to finance a few um, financial deals with, again, this was a bank, uh, you know, de depository bank that was suddenly allowed to act like an investment bank. So there's been this long history, um, and uh, so we'll be taking a look at that, but, you know, much more focused on what's going on now, although, you know, there's, uh, I've been working on the history section, which is kind of why it's at the top of my head, but, you know, sort of how, we got to this statement, state with uh, the financial institutions, sort of where they came from, who they give to, and a little bit more uh, broken down like that. We'll be looking at sort of the appropriations process and the budgeting process in January. I mentioned super PAC donors will also be in January. And then the other things that we want to do, um, there is a piece that we're going to do looking at the big union donors. And again, you know, it's much harder to quantify them. Um, we found that, you know, if you look at some of the things that unions lobby for, like some of them lobby on defense issues. Um, uh, some of the machine machinists, uh, you know, they work on things like the Abrams tank. They work on things like, um, um, uh, you know, uh, air, um, airplanes, you know, helicopters, and so on. Uh, so, you know, it's, but it's harder to come up with any kind of quantification or any kind of, um, you know, numbers like that, like you can with contracts and so on. And then a last piece, we have a site called Docket Wrench uh, that um, has federal regulations. And we are going to try to at least give some kind of idea of the impact that these organizations have on regulations and what, you know, what it means when these organizations, um, you know, are uh, pushing a regulatory agenda. Although that's much harder, also hard to quantify in a lot of reading. <laughs> Um, are there any other questions on, on the phone? Uh, feel free to hit star six to unmute your phone. I'll probably have uh, time for probably one or two more. Okay. Um, questions going once, going twice. I see a couple of reporters on here. I'm really amazed that there's no questions from uh, uh, from my journalist brethren. But um, anyway, uh, if you do have questions you want to ask me afterwards, I mean, my email is right here, uh, ballison at sunlightfoundation.com. Please feel free to. Um, I am sometimes on Twitter, and you can always give me a phone call, too. Uh, that's actually uh, sometimes the best way to get me. Okay, and we'll be archiving this webinar, and we'll have it on, on the website, and we'll shoot out a link um, as soon as we have it up on, online. I uh, just want to thank everyone for joining us today, and I uh, hope to catch you on our next webinar. Um, and also, feel free to um, uh, follow up on, on the stories. There are a number of links that I shared uh, throughout the, the presentation today, so uh, feel free to... Um, follow the analysis by Bill on Six Fortune. So thank you again for joining us, and um, we'll see you on another webinar soon. Thanks. Thank you all. Thank you.